Coming up on Chopper's Politics. The only diversity the BBC needs is actually some people with different opinions and don't have this sort of metropolitan left-wing, lentil-eating, sandal-wearing, beard-growing outlook. I'm Christopher Hope, The Telegraph's chief political correspondent, also known as Chopper, and welcome to another episode of Chopper's Politics. Power. That's what's the heart of most of what I cover, and it's what drives Westminster. Who has it? Who wants it? Who's using it right? And who's not? It's also the one key difference between MPs and their constituents. So on today's show, I'll be talking to a politician who says ministers aren't powerful enough. Former International Development Secretary Amri Trevelyan will be here, telling me why the cogs in Whitehall often just don't work. And I'll be chatting to an MP who spent a decade on the Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee, Philip Davies, about what's gone wrong with the ever-powerful BBC. But first, how much power do individual MPs actually have within their own party? How often do rumblings of a rebellion against the party line really succeed? Well, this week, one of those rebellions certainly mattered. On Wednesday, Boris Johnson finally reached a compromise with Tory rebels by agreeing to give them a final say on overriding the Brexit divorce deal. Former Attorney General Geoffrey Cox was one of dozens of Tory MPs who refused to back the PM's controversial internal markets bill. And so, let us say with Milton, methinks I see in my mind a noble and puissant nation rousing herself like a strong man after sleep and shaking her invincible locks. Now, Geoffrey Cox, you heard that clip there from your brilliant speech in October 2018 to the Tory party conference. Yes, I did. Yes, uh, it takes me back, Chris. Now, it was a moment when you burst onto the, I would say you were well known around Westminster, you burst onto the national stage. Uh, you, you described Britain as a strong man waking from a sleep. In which case, why can't we rip up bits of international law to get the best deal out of the European Union? Because the British strength is based on its faithful and rigorous observance of the rule of law and on an international and historic reputation for keeping its word when it is solemnly given. And it is beneath the dignity of the British Crown to renege on a deal, an agreement it solemnly undertook just nine months ago. It is a matter of national honour, and it is a matter of Britain's reputation in the world. And ultimately, if we were to do that, and I'm not saying that that is the government's intention, because we've moved on uh, over the last few days, um, but if that was the intention, then I don't think it would be consistent with the greatness of this country or with the important objective of ensuring that as we leave the European Union, we do so with our heads held high. So that's really the reason. Of course, and those are the points which many lawyers have made and MPs concerned have made. Isn't it the case, though, that this measure was purely a a break glass in emergency measure? It's it's required if there's no deal because we can't have the European Union running part of this marvellous UK uh, if there's no deal. And that's why it was there as, as a way to get a deal, a method to get it. Well, it's not quite as simple as that. The, the fact is that no deal was an obviously foreseeable consequence of the agreement that we signed. The whole purpose of the protocol was to take effect in the event of no deal. That's why the European Union wanted it. Look, you know, I think it's important for me to cut to the point here. I don't have any problem at all with the government using emergency powers provided they use those powers in circumstances that the law and the basic sense of justice would permit. If the European Union is guilty of egregious bad faith, and certainly some of the reports 
indicate a very strong conviction inside the government that that might be so, well, in those circumstances, you get very much closer to being able to say to the European Union, in order to protect ourselves and our fundamental interests, we do need to take unilateral action. But what you must do is you must invoke the processes that you agreed to under the treaty of dispute resolution procedures. You agreed to them and we must invoke them. So therefore, in order to override bits of the WA, the withdrawal agreement, we need to invoke the committee, this shadowy committee, which decides disputes and then do it. So that would delay it all, wouldn't it? For a no, 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 no. You, you see, again, this, this is oversimplistic, Chris, if you'll forgive me. What the, the, it's a two, the, the dispute resolution mechanism in the, in the protocol is a two-stage process. First, you try to solve it in the joint committee. It's shadowy, perhaps because that's the way it's being done at the moment, but there's no need for that. It can be done uh, with transparency. And then if you can't agree, you invoke the arbitral mechanism, which requires going to independent arbitrators appointed by the UK and by the EU to resolve the problem. Now, in the meantime, if the situation is one of emergency, if there is an urgent and necessary need to protect ourselves against a legal vacuum or against serious problems, well, then in those circumstances, it could be argued that to take unilateral protective measures, self-protective measures, would be legitimate. And all I am arguing is that a government, a British government, on behalf of the British Crown, can you imagine Margaret Thatcher doing anything else, should act within the law. But the law permits us to take steps to protect ourselves against egregious, unfair and unreasonable actions by the EU. I don't think we should be saying we're going to act like the strong man who doesn't believe in the law. We know where that gets to eventually. Are you going to abstain in future votes? Have you made your point on Tuesday and will you be back into the government fold next week at the uh, amendment stage, the, the, the committee stage? I'm very much encouraged by the direction of travel. I understand, I haven't studied it yet in depth, but there's a statement which I shall look at close, look at very closely. I understand that the government will bring forward an amendment to permit Parliament to make a decision at the time of the use of these powers. And my view is it all depends on the circumstances in which these powers might be used and how they're used. And so a parliamentary vote at that point is a major step forward. But I'm afraid there is a but. Michael Gove and the Prime Minister made certain assurances at the dispatch box during the debate, which were very encouraging because each said that it would only be used, the powers granted under this bill, in circumstances where there was a breach of the duty of good faith by the European Union and we would invoke the arbitral mechanisms. Now, if that's correct, we are rapidly getting back onto what I would call territory of legality. And I will want to explore those things with the government. I'm very keen to support it. I am, as you know, Chris, a committed uh, exponent of our leaving the European Union uh, by conviction. And it places me in a very awkward and, and frankly, painful situation because I understand the government's objectives and I do not share a lot of the hysteria that surrounds this. But I cannot be in a situation where I endorse law-breaking by the British government. And I repeat, can you imagine Margaret Thatcher openly saying she was going to break it? Well, she's sadly not here to say whether she'd have done it, but we we can speculate. Could you not support it because you're a lawyer, because you couldn't practice anymore as a brilliant QC if you had supported it in in Parliament? Someone has said that's the case. I, I can't support it because... On the face of it at the moment, the powers are intended to be used in violation of our own solemn word. It's it's, it's not complicated, Chris. I mean, you gave your word nine months ago, and then you say, well, we have our fingers crossed behind the back. Now, now, uh, overnight, we've had uh, Joe Biden uh, warning the UK in a tweet. 
may be playing to his voters in the States, but there we are, saying that the UK must not jeopardise the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, with any deal. Uh, this doesn't, does it? Because, because the only way a hard border might be erected is if, is if the EU do it, right? So, why, so it's the wrong target, is that right? Well, I, I don't believe it's ever going to get to that, which is why, as I say, I'm very encouraged by the progress thus far and the discussions that the government is having. I don't believe the government really intends to use these things in the most flagrant breach. I think it intends to use it if the kind of unreasonable, and it would be unreasonable behaviour that the Prime Minister has identified, is committed. So I don't think we're ever going to get to that. But look, the problem about that argument, Chris, is that there are laws that apply to any border between two nations, between two customs territories uh, in this case. Now, those laws are unavoidable. And we looked very closely at some of the mechanisms that might otherwise be um, um, implemented. And at the moment, they would be very, very difficult to achieve. But I don't think we'll get there. I think, I hope, uh, a common sense will break out in the European Union, and we will achieve a breakthrough. And if anybody can do it, this Prime Minister can. But do you think Joe Biden's comments are aimed, they should be aimed at the EU and the UK, not just... I think they should, yes. I think they definitely should. I mean, I think the Democratic candidate is almost certainly, as you say, an election is coming. But I I don't think the distant thunder from across the Atlantic (laughs) helps any problems, as we saw from previous presidents who've made comments about our domestic affairs. There's lots of talk about the PM's future. Tory MPs are saying to me that he may jump ship after Brexit. Can you believe that? No, I don't believe it. I had the great pleasure of seeing him recently at Appledore, where he came bounding in with his usual energy and charmed everybody. We went round the shipyard, which we, I must say, just just reopened uh, under the ownership of Harlan and Wolf. Very good. A, a great moment for the Southwest and for my constituency and Norwich and, and the Appledore area. So, he, he was on good form there. And I, I see the Prime Minister moving on to achieve what we set out to achieve when we won the election, which is to complete Brexit and to move on to make this country a much better place for neglected parts of our nation that haven't received proper attention in the past. And by that you mean fishing communities, I imagine, but other other places too. I mean those, I mean parts of uh, the North. I know there is a committed vision, but it's a huge challenge. And as I've often said, Chris, I think to you, the, the, the vote was not only the leaving of the European Union. It must result in tangible and real progress for areas of our nation that hasn't seen it up till now. Geoffrey Cox, it's been great to have you on. Just one final question. Will you come back at Christmas time to read us some more Christmas readings to cheer up our readers in these dark months, particularly if it's the second COVID spike? I would be delighted. It's <laughs> been a pleasure. All the best. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, Chris. Now, if money really does equal power, then some of the BBC's top-paid stars have power by the bucket load. This week, one of those top names, Zoe Ball, was given a £1 million pay rise to host the BBC Radio 2's breakfast show. And all this is a corporation's Tory critics continue to carp on what they see as left-wing bias in the BBC. Philip Davies has been a member of the Digital Culture and Media Sport Committee in the House of Commons for 10 years and a Tory MP since 2005. And it's a big week this week for him in more ways than one. Philip Davis MP, welcome to the podcast. Now, it's a busy time. You're getting married, aren't you, on Saturday? I am indeed, yes. All being well. Is it, will it be a, a rule of six? Or is it 30, isn't it? 30 guests you can have. It is. We're actually getting married in Parliament. Uh, in the chapel there, uh, Public Health England have said we can only have 20. So uh, 20? only 20 so uh, and that includes me and Esther and the vicar and the organist and the photographer so it doesn't leave much room for guests so it's going to be a pretty a pretty low-key small gathering I should have said that you're marrying Esther McVeigh of course the Tory MP and also the uh, former working pension secretary but Philip Davis you're on this podcast to talk about the BBC because you do sit on the on the digital culture media and sport committee what did you think when you saw these extraordinary pay rises this week for BBC stars Well, I think most people will be horrified that at the same time as the BBC are ending free TV licences for the over 75s, because supposedly they can't afford it, they have managed to be able to afford such a largesse for their 
so-called stars. And I say so-called stars because it seems on the face of it that uh, Zoe Ball has got a million pounds extra for, for losing a million listeners, which seems like an extraordinary reward for failure. Mm. Uh, and Gary Lineker is being trumpeted because he's, he's had a pay cut to, I think, £1.3 million from £1.75 yes. million, pounds, as if that's some kind of triumph for the licence fee payer. His salary alone would pay for every single over 75 free TV license in my constituency. And he's he's there to, to present match of the day. Now, I'm an avid football fan. I'd, admittedly, I support Bradford City and, and therefore uh, my team's <laughs> never on match of the day, unfortunately. But I, I watch match of the day. I don't watch it to watch Gary Lineker. I would watch match of the day, as I suspect most football fans would, if there were no presenters on there because we want to watch the highlights from the matches earlier in the Day, that's what we want to watch. Yeah. We certainly don't watch it because of Gary Lineker and the idea that he needs to be paid 1.3 or 1.7, whichever figure they choose, million pounds a year for him to present that. Otherwise, nobody would watch Match of the Day. Is just frankly laughable, and it just goes to show how out of touch they are with the with their viewers. This year, we saw a big jump in women being paid more. Do you think the BBC hasn't got the right message? Because the concern is more about overall pay. I mean, it's great to pay women more, of course it is, and to equalise that gender pay gap. But equally, is the, is the point not that there should be a, an overall decline in pay, but level up women? Is that the point? Well, look, I mean, I've, I've said in the past, I think the BBC for many years has been run as, as like some kind of old boys club. And whether that's with the people, or the, the so-called talent, or whether it's the, the, the management. And that there was clearly a disparity between what men were paid and what women were paid, and that it was unjustifiable. But my contention was that it wasn't that the women were paid too little, it was the men were paid too much. And it seems to me that the, the, the BBC have learned completely the wrong lesson from this. What, what, what it needed was a, a good dose of pay cuts for the men. It didn't need massive salary increases for the women to put them on unjustifiable salaries too. And the context, of course, is this the requirement that over 75s must pay for their TV licences from the 1st of August. Are you hearing reports of dawn raids on old people's homes yet? Well, I, have, I haven't heard that uh, yet, but I think, I think the BBC are in for a shock because I think a lot of people aren't going to pay. I think that is, that is certainly the case. Um, and, you know, the, the, the one thing that's really, that hasn't really come out of this is that on the free TV licence stuff, since the government announced that they were passing it over to the BBC, there was a sliding scale. The government were paying less and less each year and the, and the BBC were paying more and more each year. Last year, the BBC paid £450 million towards free TV licences and the government paid the remaining £250 million. Now the BBC claim they can only afford £200 to £250 million for the TV licence concession. They are basically saving £200 million a year on the back of over 75s in order to give these huge salaries to their top stars. And that is completely unjustifiable. Don't you think, though, that equivalent stars on, on other stations will be paid, Anton Deck, let's say, to take two, will be paid similarly high figures and don't want to be, to be showing off their top talent? Well, look, ITV is a commercial organisation. They need to earn their income from advertisers. Therefore, it, it is a market price. It's a, it's, a, it's a trade-off. They pay somebody a certain amount of money and know that they'll get certain advertising revenue in return. The BBC don't need to do that. The BBC's got guaranteed income. They don't need to pay huge stars huge salaries. Uh, they, they've actually got an opportunity to bring on new talent, bring on people who the other commercial people can use at a, at a later date. And, and the BBC should use their privileged role to actually do some good rather than just pay excessive salaries to people who probably yeah. couldn't earn that salary anywhere else. Are you looking forward to your invitation to present Have I Got News For You, Philip Davis? Because they want to try and... They're so worried about uh, left-wing bias on comedy programmes. Well, the BBC's got left-wing bias not just on comedy programmes, it's on their political programmes as well. They've got BBC bias everywhere. I think, uh, I think it may be a step too far expecting that they're going to call me in to present anything on the <laughs> BBC, to be fair. How do you prove bias? You say it's bias, don't you, there, in political programmes. Is it really? Isn't the point of the BBC that they basically have to annoy everybody to be unbiased? 
No, I think what the, the the difference is from when I was a, a younger person, and what and I, I love the BBC when I was when I was growing up, is that first of all you wouldn't know what the political opinions were of anybody on the BBC, and they wouldn't offer them. Now the presenters don't just ask questions; they can't help but offer their opinions as well about everything, and that's what I object to. I, I don't care whether it's a conservative opinion or a left-wing opinion we, i don't want bbc yeah. presenters giving us their opinions on yeah. things that's not their job their job is to ask questions and to give some analysis they can't help themselves they've got to tell us what they think about everything and, and that's what uh, people don't appreciate who's your favorite least biased bbc tv presenter well i think everyone accepts that andrew neil was uh, was the best in class he would give everybody a hard time jeremy paxman was the same he he would give everybody a hard time john humphreys i would say you know these people they didn't care who came before them they would give everybody a hard time yeah. and and that's all you ask i don't i don't want them to give government ministers an easy ride i'm the last person to want to give a government minister an easy ride but what i what i do want is them to get to to be equal to everybody what you see at the moment is conservative ministers get interrupted every 5 seconds and a a, a, a labor spokesman comes on and they they they're allowed to say what they like for as long as they like isn't the case philip davis that this always happens when a party's been in power for over say 8 years certainly in the late 80s there were similar angst uh, issues about the the tories and the bbc and don't forget alistair campbell in the early part of, the, of this century over iraq so isn't it the case that the party in power is always interrogated more and that's why it feels like there's bias against the government from comedy or or or, or politics or wherever yeah, but it's not it's not just biased against the government. It's 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 about Brexit. I mean, the BBC were, you know, were virtually campaigning to overturn the referendum result. I don't think they've still done one programme exploring the opportunities of Brexit. It's all been a, a misery. It's, it's not, a, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I wouldn't say campaigning, but certainly they do seem to think it's a problem to be solved more than an opportunity to be grasped. You know what I mean? It's that difference, isn't it, I think? Well, I mean, you know, th- th- there wasn't a barely a day went by with the, with that, the Today programme having Ken Clark or Michael Heseltine on telling us why we should be overturning the referendum results. I can't believe that was just a coincidence that they were the only two people they could find to be interviewed about Brexit. You know, so it's not just that. It's all the sort of politically correct stuff as well that we get shoved down our throats by the BBC every five minutes. So it's not, it's not just about the government. This is just a more general sort of left-wing politically correct organization that is basically yeah. out of tune with the rest of the country and they, they're spending a hundred million pounds supposedly on diversity the only diversity the bbc needs is actually some people with different opinions and don't don't have this sort of metropolitan left-wing lentil eating sandal wearing beard growing outlook they need to get out more that's what i always tell people at the bbc get out more get out into the regions a bit more and find out that people don't share that politically correct view of the world have you asked uh, Tim Davy out for a drink yet? No, no. But I mean, I, I mean, to be fair to him, I think he he uh, uh, the early signs are that I think he recognises some of these issues. Whether he can see them through and 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 change the culture at the BBC remains to be seen. But I think he certainly seems a, a step in the right direction from Lord Hall. Philip Davis, you're approaching the happiest day of your life on Saturday. We wish you all the best in the podcast and best of luck getting married. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Right, in just one moment, I'll be speaking to Anne-Marie Trevelyan in a very first interview since her role as International Development Secretary was abolished by Boris Johnson. Right after this. We're interrupting this podcast to bring you news of another Telegraph show we think you might like. It's called Planet Normal, and it's hosted by me, Liam Halligan. And me, Alison Pearson. We're both Telegraph columnists who share the view that far too often those who shout the loudest on the telly just don't represent the views of normal people. So take a trip with us to Planet Normal. We're joined by some stellar guests, well-known voices from politics, business and the arts. All from different fields, but they have one thing in common. They're at the top of their game, but distinctly down to earth. The good news is I finally learned what a podcast is and even how you subscribe to it. It's actually quite simple. Search for Planet Normal on your podcast app or click on the link in the show notes for this episode. You don't really know what a podcast is, do you? I am one. Look, I am one. Who needs to know what it is? I am one. Okay, shut up. And we're back. Now, until two weeks ago, 
Anne-Marie Trevelyan was a cabinet minister. And then the department she ran, DFID, was merged into the Foreign Office. And she was out of a job. So I started by asking Anne-Marie Trevelyan if she's crossed with Boris Johnson. And would she be back? Uh, well, will I be back is a question you're very welcome to ask him. I have, uh, you know, uh, every uh, willingness and keenness to support him in any way he wishes me to do so. The Prime Minister's passion for getting this right and really creating a, you know, what one might call a kind of global affairs department, you know, the the bit of government that is thinking with our international partners, with all those tools in one place, has been a, you know, bugbear and passion of his for a long time. So I wasn't at all surprised when he actually decided that this this was what he wanted to do and get it up and running before we become... It wasn't in a manifesto, was it, though? There was, a, you know, a clear level intent of how he focuses his international work. I think the for, in foreign affairs is always a, a, a fluid area in, in that sense. But, you know, we're taking over the uh, chairmanship of the G7 next year, and I think this, this is all part of his wider conversation. But how are you? You, 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 don't, you don't sound angry about it. You seem resigned or just happy that... Your job's been wound into something else, and you're out of government. I mean, the, the pay cut. You know, how is a how is AMT feeling? Uh, AMT is taking the opportunity to do those things that, when you are a secretary of state, you don't have time to do because the hours are, like talk, are pretty like long. Talk to this podcast. So I did like catching up with you, Christopher. But there's always things to do. You know, constituency. Uh, more constituency time is always lovely and to catch up with, you know, now that we're able to get out and about, you know, local businesses and uh, organisations a bit more. So that's always, always lovely. And we are, at the end of the day, all of us, we're MPs first. Everything else in government is is extra and incredibly extraordinary opportunity to have those opportunities to, to help serve in a particular part of government. But at the end of the day, we're MPs first. What did you learn about how the civil servant runs when you were there? It was a fascinating, if short, tenure in DFID with an extraordinary team. Clearly, uh, I arrived in February, just three weeks before the COVID-19 crisis you know, kicked off in full in the UK. But in the first three weeks, we were already uh, looking at the impacts that we were seeing across the globe. So I was both getting to know my civil servants and getting up to speed on a global pandemic, something which nobody had actually dealt with in practice before. But I think what I immediately uh, had a sense of, what there was a, a great deal of activity, if it is a very you know, delivery-focused place. But the challenge of this new, huge global problem that was kicking off was something that everyone was struggling to get their head around. The international organisations with whom obviously DFID has a very close relationship, like the World Health Organisation, the World Bank. Um, these were organisations where we have very strong relationships and it's the civil servants who maintain those relationships clearly as the politicians you know, come in and out of post. And it was clear very early that this was a real stretch and test of the machinery of government. Do you think the machinery of government has been found wanting? I mean, did you feel ever when you were there that you were fully in control of the department? Or is it the case that it's really civil servants who keep it all ticking over while politicians pull levers which have nothing on the end of them? So I think many levers do work. But the challenge, uh, and I think, you know, politicians perhaps need to you know, as they take on these roles, have a better understanding of the subtleties of the system. You know, the the, the civil service, the, the Whitehall civil service are the chieftains keeping the machinery going in DFID, its program management, its risk governance, those sorts of issues. In the health service, it would be different again, in education, uh, different again. But the civil servants in Whitehall are the overseers, both of policy and delivery. And the politicians are there both to keep all of that moving. A civil servant, you know, won't go off and do something random without a minister's approval. So there's a very there's a very strong relationship there and a very important relationship. But actually if a politician wants to try and change the direction or push it forward, everybody has to sort of stop what they're doing and really try and get to grips with the new direction. So I think the sense I always had was that the machinery will keep going whatever happens. And that's the extraordinary beauty of our civil service is it, it holds the country together in a ticking over kind of way. But when you need to stretch it, everybody has to come out of that status quo uh, perspective and be able to think differently. And in the case of the pandemic, and obviously within DFID, you know, healthcare 
education, maintaining education systems, all those things in our developing countries was something that we were asking our teams to uh, think about and shift to. And and that's not easy. So we, through Diffid, have invested in a number of uh, technologies in the, both the testing and uh, other spaces. That was hard for the system to do at pace because it's not designed to work at that pace. So you're asking people who are employed to do a particular type of ongoing management uh, to do something different. Do you think that the Dominic Cummings' alleged frustration with the civil servant is well placed, having been at the top of one of our big departments. So I think he's uh, his his frustration at wanting an answer immediately and being able to deliver it immediately is a big ask. And in a pandemic, clearly, you know, the ability to have the right tools at your disposal as quickly as possible to look after uh, our population is what we would always like. But that isn't always straightforward. And the levels of rigor and governance and uh, financial management, which we have vested in the civil service to manage for us, uh, for our taxpayers, is one which needs to uh, develop, I think, if we're to be able to, as effectively as possible, move at speed when we need to. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges. We have to vest in them a different set of both requirements, but and tools uh, in order to take them to a different level. I think you're saying modernise it a bit, aren't you? But uh, Well, I think some different skill sets. So I think one of the yeah. things I found, you know, DFID's a relatively scientific department because we're dealing with complex programming, financial risks, but, you know, lots of other risks as well if, if they're in vulnerable countries. So I have quite a lot of technical people, a team of economists, um, lots of scientific people. But actually within the broader cohort of program managers, speaking as an accountant, someone who thinks in numbers personally, everything's very wordy. So I need I need data to really understand a problem and to make a decision. And, and it's getting it's getting at that data and, is the problem. But if, if we recruit people who are, you know, liberal arts, you know, specialists, great minds, but who think in words Yes. We're asking quite a lot of them suddenly think in numbers because that's not how their, exactly. you know, their training or their natural uh, way of thinking is. So I think there's a mix perhaps that we need to increase and and to invest more training in that data analytics, which is I think is something that Dominic Cummings is very keen on. What's the issue with aid money and why is it criticised by right wing politicians, if if I can put it that way? So it's a very interesting question, and I you know I'm known for often challenging whether we're We've spent our aid, you know, the right way. I think the British people, and I think, you know, around the world in developed countries where countries commit a level of their taxpayers' money to foreign aid, um, people are very generous spirited and they will always help, you know, someone in need. And that is all this is. The challenge with how we spend that taxpayers' money is always a political choice. And I think for a, a number of years now, DFID had sort of just was getting on with making its own choices. So the interesting thing about creating the FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office as it now is, is that actually, you know, since since Blair's time, governments haven't really uh, talked about both what the foreign aid is that we're delivering and why it's important. So the yeah. Prime Minister in our manifesto was really particularly focused on um, girls' education and preventable diseases and eliminating malaria. Those are issues that he really, you know, understands can shift the dial for countries forever if you can move that. But we don't talk about it enough in a, in the sense of how important it is. You know, we wouldn't we wouldn't think it was okay to have occasional education that wasn't much cop, you know, here for our children. Um, and if the countries that we want to see grow and develop and become stronger are going to do that, they need great education for their kids too. And if we can help set rigorous, you know, good systems up, then that's a really good investment, not only because it's good for those children and for that country, but it's good for us too, because that helps that country become stronger. International development investment in its broadest sense is working with countries who are now independent and wanting to grow and become strong and to work with those governments. So, you know, there are countries who would, would take, you know, foreign aid money and not really make much progress. Honestly, I think we should be very firm and say, well, if, if you, you know, don't want to invest and help 
grow your own healthcare systems, education systems. Actually, we don't want to work with you because we want to help you to grow. So, you know, Ethiopia is a really good example of a country that's really making great strides. And, you know, where a few years ago we were, you know, funding and doing a great deal of the legwork, they're now taking it on themselves. They've built their taxation systems and they're a much stronger country. And that's what good international development should do. It should help a country get to a point where it doesn't need international investment anymore in that sense. Is the problem with aid money you're trying to hit a moving target in terms of your budget? If if you're trying to hit 0.7% of GDP in year, then by the end of that financial year, you're not quite sure how much money you've got to spend, you know, plus or minus 100 million pounds, I imagine, some years. So the the absolutely fixed 0.7% of GNI commitment that David Cameron put into law, I think it's a really good commitment as a statement of commitment to our uh, international partners. But I think you're right. I think there is a question as to whether we should keep it as a hard, you know, 12 month spend rather than have some sort of flex. You know, for instance, a you know, this year, average, so. yeah, might, might we not want to spend more and then, you know, not grow new programs next year or, you know, to have that flex or over the course of a parliament or, you know, what you like. Because I think there is the challenge and you get to, I mean, this year will be different because everything's slightly out of kilter. But fundamentally you know you get to sort of november and some programs have run more slowly so they haven't spent as much as you thought they would and then you've suddenly got to meet this actual figure because we've legislated quite rightly for it and you end up making a you know a substantial contribution probably to one of the international organizations who do you know great work and you know the money isn't disappearing into a black hole it's going somewhere useful but it's perhaps not the ideal choice we would have made we might have rather, you know, prepared another education program with a particular country, rather than just put it into a big, you know, kind of multinational pot. So I think, I think there's something to be said for that. It's something I've discussed with the Chancellor. And I'm sure that the Foreign Secretary, uh, as ever, the Chancellor never, you know, never gives anything away. Isn't that the art of a good Chancellor? You smile sweetly and just take it all in. But I think I think the Foreign Secretary, uh, I have no doubt, will have that on his list of conversations as well. Anne-Marie Trevelyan, thank you so much for joining us this week on Choppers Politics. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before I leave you, a special shout out to a listener called James, who put a smile on my face with his five star rating on Apple Podcasts. James wrote, It's such a shame we are so tribal in politics. Hearing Chopper's tone has also changed the way I read his written pieces in the paper. Now I read with empathy between the lines. Well, in my view, we need more people like James in the world of politics. Thank you, James. And if, like James, you're a fan of what I do and what colleagues do here at The Telegraph, please take out a free 30-day subscription by going to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. And please do follow James' example by leaving us a five-star rating if you like the show. It boosts us up the podcast charts and gets us in front of more eyes and into more ears. And if you're not sure how to leave a review, please ping us an email, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk and we'll reveal all. But I promise we won't tell you what to write. Or message us on Twitter at chopperspodcast. Thanks to my guests this week, Jeffrey Cox, Philip Davis, and of course, Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Thanks to my producers, Louisa Wells, Edith Lampett, and Theo Luludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. Without you listening, we wouldn't be here. All that's left for me to do is remind you always, if you can, to buy a copy of The Daily Telegraph, available from all good news agents. Until next time, cheerio!